People say dumb things all the time, but when it comes to sharks, they get extra stupid. But there are a few things that stand out and are perpetuated and said more often than others. I'm Skylar Thomas. Welcome to my top list of stupid things people say about sharks. Okay, here we go. First of all, I'm not presenting these in any particular order. I'll let you guys decide which are the worst of the ones I present today. But to warm up, here's an honorable mention. Maybe not the dumbest, but definitely annoying, are the overnight animal experts who are letting everyone know that orcas are the king of the ocean, not the white shark. Thank you, since you learned what an orca was on the same day that you found out that they kill great white sharks. Lions aren't the king of the jungle. They don't even live in a jungle. It's a saying. People say things that sound cool, but you are correct. So for all of you keyboard warriors who are letting us know that orcas are the king of the ocean, and not white sharks, thanks for enlightening us. Number one. Lurking also known as swimming aggressively. With more and more cameras and more and more people in the ocean, there are more and more shots revealing that people are in the water with sharks at the same time. That's the way it always was, except now we're seeing the sharks there. But tabloids and our general unawareness of how animals behave leads everyone to quickly believe that shark must have wanted to kill that person I mean, it was a shark in the water at the same time that a person's in the water. Isn't it incredible that so many people are managing to get out of the water when the most incredible predator this planet, oh, wait a minute, sorry, that's the orca. We just clarified that. The most feared predator on this planet was stalking them, and yet they managed to keep getting out of the ocean alive. Sharks in the ocean are lurking. Sharks in the ocean, when there's a person around, are swimming aggressively, particularly when swimming toward a person. But let's be honest, it also means when they're swimming away from a person or just swimming in the ocean that they live in, while humans are in that ocean and cameras are capturing it. Because sharks are not allowed to be in the ocean when humans are in the ocean without it meaning that sharks want to kill the human. What else would a shark do with its time after all? They were put on this planet to kill us. It blows my mind how we continue to escape from these situations, being the stealthy, incredibly physically capable creatures that we are when we go in the ocean. And the media continues to capture all of these occasions in which we survive because the most feared predator on the planet, not the king of the ocean, but the most feared predator on the planet continues to fail to be able to kill these people that aren't even aware that it's there while it is lurking and stalking and swimming aggressively. Man, how the hell did sharks ever get to survive as long as they did if they can't kill us when we don't even know that they're there? And if we want to talk about the phrase swimming aggressively, Let's be real about the fact that it only applies to things that we're afraid of, because if a different type of fish is swimming toward the camera, or a sea lion, or a dolphin, or basically anything other than a shark, it's curious, it's cute, it's a special moment between the diver, or the cameraman, and the animal, but not when it's a shark. A shark cannot swim toward you, a shark can't swim away. The shark kind of needs to stop existing at all, otherwise it had bad intentions. Now, I can't leave this particular topic without touching on the people who swim at netted beaches with this perception that it was providing safety. I would like to tell you about all the faces of these people who thought that they were not anywhere near sharks because of the nets and then find out that most of the sharks caught in the nets are caught leaving the beach. Their faces are like, that can't be possible, but it is possible. So what is the only explanation if a shark was with you that whole time and you didn't get injured and we killed it anyway? Well, I guess that's just life on planet human. Number two. 
this has got to be the top of the list for me. It's the, we know nothing about these incredible animals, also known as the 400 million year mystery or solving the puzzle of the shark. I'm gonna approach this one on three levels. One, it's just wrong. We know a ton about these animals. Two, if we're gonna say we don't know much about sharks, we kind of have to admit we don't know much about anything. And three, so what? Why do we have to know? All right, so for number one, I've actually got to break that down into subcategories because it's a little bit complicated. First of all, the idea that we know nothing about these sharks is completely wrong because there's an incredible amount of information that's been acquired through observation and through studies, peer-reviewed studies, and people who just go out and enjoy time with sharks. But with so many species of shark, of course there are gonna be different amounts of information that have been learned about each species. So let's look at a popular one like the white shark, which ironically, people still love to say, we know next to nothing about these animals. It's just not true. All you have to do is spend the time to look up all the papers that people have spent a great deal of effort writing or the documentaries that have been made or look at the information on my own website about these animals. Let me give you a few examples off the top of my head. We not only know their migration routes, we know that there are subpopulations that don't interact with other populations and have their own migration routes. On those migrations, we know how fast they go at what time of the migration that they go. We know how often they dive during the migration. We know how many times they beat their tails during the migration at different times of the migration. We know how deep they go and for how long they go. We know what they eat at different depths because of stable isotopes. We know almost every trivial detail about their anatomy that you can think of, going all the way from how their liver works to the rods and cones of their eyes, to how they compensate for a refraction and lift their heads above the water to look around. We know their average age. We have a pretty good idea of their maximum age. We know what their sexual maturity age is and what their sexual maturity size is. We know their gestation period. We know how large their litters are. We know what size the babies are. We know that they're endothermic. We know how their body temperature works. We know about wonder nets. We know about the ampullae of Lorenzini. We know about all their many different ways of hunting and detecting. What's the distance between the dorsal fin and the caudal fin? What's the distance between those fins at a certain age? How much time does the shark spend at a certain depth at a certain age? At this point, we even know that the babies are being contaminated in the womb by the pollution in the ocean. We've analyzed to death almost every hunting strategy that you can think of. We know that their diet changes as they mature. We know that different populations have slightly different pigmentation. We even know where their pupping grounds are despite what you hear in the media. No, we haven't actually caught a white shark being born on film. Is that what it's going to take for us to say that we know everything to actually see it taking place? Because as far as you know, when we do capture that on film, it might not be where they normally give birth because of our interference in order to get the footage. But I will say this, where we suspect that they are giving birth is the same five decades later as it was when we used to suspect those locations, except that now people who profit on the exploitation of these animals claiming that we're learning these things via technology and tagging are coming to the same conclusions that we came to as the people who were using visual evidence of the actual physical presence of babies in those same locations. And if we extend this theme beyond white sharks, some of them look like rocks, while others blend perfectly into the deep blue sea. Yes, some of them even have venom, venomous horns. Some lay eggs, some give birth to live young. Some have babies that eat the other babies while they're in the womb. We've even captured this on film. Saying we know hardly anything about these animals is like saying that you can't see a painting in front of you because someone removed one shade of the color of the sky that's in the background of the subject of the painting. But a subcategory of that is not only do we have all of those studies, but now we're coming up with studies that tell us things that we used to know and should know logically. For example, finding out that animals make these incredible migrations. Look, most animals migrate. We're one of the only ones that doesn't migrate, and we used to migrate. 
we don't migrate now because we found a way to manipulate our surroundings to where we don't have to migrate. But the fact that we are finding out that most species migrate and go places to fulfill certain things in their lives, such as mating or giving birth or feeding or following temperatures, that's just a basic part of life for most animals. That's not an incredible discovery. Now, I'm not saying it's not interesting, but let's admit that we are doing it for the sake of satisfying curiosities or for academic purposes. It's not because it's a necessity, but I'm digressing to point three again. Some of these other studies are revealing things such as that predators like to use stealth while hunting. Well, thank you very much. Other studies are showing that prey experience stress when they're being hunted. I mean, come on. We don't need studies about some of these things. The real point here is that we do know a lot about these animals. Exactly how much do we need to know? Because we seem to have this endless quest to find out every last possible thing that we can know about these sharks. And the only thing, in my opinion, we need to know is that they go places for a reason. They don't go there for the hell of it. Therefore, we already know that it's an important part of their lives. This brings me to point two. If we're gonna say that we don't know anything about sharks, we kinda have to say that about most living creatures. Yeah, it sounds good. I mean, sharks are mysterious and they live in the mysterious ocean. They're under the surface. So, yeah, oh yeah, what, what, what's that thing doing? But really, what do you know about animals that are right next to you on land? How much do we know in our current lifestyle, which pretty much revolves around our jobs and our iPhones and making a dollar, how much do you know about, say, a deer? Do you really know much about deer? Other than some people hunt them and sometimes your car hits them and that they have hooves and they walk around and eat plants? I mean, are you or are people on average a deer expert? Are you even a dog expert? Most of us own a dog, but how much can you really tell me about your dog other than its breed, that it's a canine, that it likes to poop and it likes to eat and it likes to take walks? I'm just saying, Let's be real about how much knowledge we have about all species of animals and how much knowledge we care to obtain about those species, unless of course we attach this mysterious aura around them and get this idea that we need to know all of this stuff. I would argue that we know more about some species of sharks than we do about terrestrial animals that we come into contact with on a semi-regular basis. So. How much do we need to know about sharks? Which brings me to point number three. What is the goal of obtaining this information? Sharks were fine before humans started studying them. They were fine before humans. They were better before humans. So does that mean that the need to study sharks is to save the sharks, which is really another stupid thing that people say which deserves its own category. So I'll just touch on it briefly. Sometimes we admit that we pursue data for the sake of data. After all, scientific careers depend on continuing to collect data. But studies that are invasive, damaging, and even lethal usually use a more persuasive justification, such as saving the species, the greater good. You have to break some eggs to make an omelet. So let me go back to my comparison of our knowledge of land animals and marine animals. Lions are on their way out. Lions. And we know it. And we know why it's happening. But we're not stopping it. Lions. Do you think the problem is that we don't know enough about lions? If humans are going to fail to save an iconic animal like the lion, a mammal that lives on land like we do, and we know everything there is to know about that animal. Why do you believe pursuing more data about a fish in the ocean is going to save it from a similar fate? I wanna reiterate, I am not ripping on knowledge, but knowledge without wisdom has limited usefulness. Knowledge just for the sake of knowledge, I have a little bit of a problem with. And the pursuit of more knowledge when we're not properly using the knowledge that we have strikes me as a little bit useless, foolish, if not even destructive.
three. All right, so what's next? For me, it's gotta be what I call, it's just a matter of time, play with fire, gonna get burned, also known as, remember the grizzly man? This one goes out to all the wisdom-filled keyboard warriors who let us know the statistical probability that applies to everything. As if this only applies to us dumbasses that swim with and interact with sharks. Way to go out on a limb there, stating that if you do something enough times, something's going to go wrong. Does that not apply to you stepping out your front door? And if I predict that someday walking out on your porch, you fall down and crack your head, do I get to say, told you so? Why doesn't it apply to surfers? That would be kinda uncool to say, I hope a surfer gets bitten. Or how about a spear fisherman? I mean, surfers have their heads above the water, floating around, no idea what's happening underneath of them. Surfing's a cool activity, but how come you're not calling them dumbasses? Talk about statistical probability increasing, going surfing every day is right up there. But way beyond that is spearfishing. Spearfishing is just begging for an interaction with a shark. But for some reason, those guys aren't dumbasses because they're there to kill something. But people that are there to learn about and educate and interact with sharks, those are the dumbasses. By no means am I saying that I want surfers to be bitten. I surf and I paddle in the ocean. I'm just pointing out this tendency for certain groups to celebrate when people trying to educate us about sharks get bitten. But when someone is bitten while engaging in a known high-risk activity, somehow that's a tragedy. It's like people desperately don't want the image of sharks to improve. This one's particularly annoying to me because each and every person who leaves this sort of a comment thinks they've just said the most profound thing ever. But not only is it the stupidity factor, it's the bloodthirstiness that's being displayed by all these people. Saying things like, I can't wait until these people get eaten. I can't wait until these people die. I can't wait until they lose an arm or a leg. Or even bringing my dog into it. I can't wait until this guy's dog dies. Really? You want my dog to die? Who are you people? Some of these shark divers being criticized have been doing this their entire lives. Many of them, most days of the year. I'm not talking about every now and then getting in the ocean and lucking out. I'm talking about people who spend 300 out of 365 days of the year in the water with sharks. But let's just cut to the chase and say that you bloodthirsty bastards get what you want and one of these more famous people that dive with sharks gets killed or whatever. So everything that they accomplished all the years of their lives, right up to that moment is just out the window. It means nothing. Ha ha ha, told you so, sharks bite people. That's the knowledge to be gained here. Nothing was gained from the interactions and the footage and what we've been taught from a first person standpoint of people that get in the water and show us what it's really like to be down there in the water with sharks. Now, as long as we're talking about how these people suddenly become idiots because something went wrong once in their entire career of shark research, let's also examine the double standard, or in some cases triple standards, of who we choose to listen to in terms of being a shark expert and who we reject. Many of you know the name Dr. Eric Ritter, who, by the way, has a refreshingly honest and insightful podcast. But you don't know him from that or any of his other great shark work. You know him because he lost his calf to a bull shark on camera. And all the shark haters of the world rejoiced and clapped and got to say, ha ha, that guy got what he deserved. Everything Eric has accomplished in his entire life and everything after that incident apparently don't mean anything because a bull shark actually bit somebody. That's not to say that being bitten by a shark was a testament to him or an accomplishment, but isn't it funny that depending on how the media or the networks want to spin it, people who have been bitten by sharks get to be hosts of shark shows because they are now experts. Eric, the shark interaction scientist, is an idiot when he gets bitten, but the buff surfer type dudes, when they get bitten, they get to host a myriad of shark shows. Then again, it's shark week, so. 
Now I'm not knocking any of these guys who were bitten by sharks and advocate for sharks. I'm knocking us for being so fickle as to accept that this person is a shark expert and that this person isn't one, even though they both were bitten by sharks. Similarly, I have a problem with the way that the media likes to make the families of the bite victims also experts. Suddenly they know whether or not we should start killing sharks. This is popular in Australia where they coal sharks at the beaches for safe beach experiences. They go out and kill thousands of different species of animals so that we can use the ocean as a swimming pool. And in the debate about whether or not that is the correct thing to do or not, when in a blue moon someone gets bitten, the media is quick to shove a camera in the emotionally distraught people's faces and say, what do you think about sharks? And this person who has just had a traumatic experience, but it's their first time encountering a shark, now gets to tell us whether or not it is the correct move to kill sharks in the ocean. Let's be honest, it doesn't really matter if the person was bitten or not, or what they had to say. It's about your predisposed position on the topic of whether or not you like sharks or if you don't like the person. For example, if I ever do get bitten, am I gonna be an idiot or do I get to have my own shark show? As far as remembering the grizzly man goes, yeah, I remember. Things didn't end too well for him, but prior to that, he lived 13 seasons with grizzly bears. That's incredible. The things he must have learned and experienced. Now we can take what people like that learn and use it, or we can just sit here and triumph at their misfortune. I'm gonna go ahead and say that the grizzly man experienced more in one week of his life than the people who live their entire lives from the safety of their homes, professing how we should live on their keyboards. You know what, that's what it really is for me. People whose overall goal or message to anyone who will listen to them is, see, look, you should be scared of the earth. Stay inside, hide, kill everything else, because the only way to survive on planet earth is to dominate the planet and get rid of anything that we're afraid of. Don't learn about those animals. Don't discover ways that you can coexist or interact without violence. Just avoid it completely or kill them all. Number four. Speaking of bears, and the fact that I have a wolf bear on my shoulder, let's move on to the next on our list. For this item on the list, I'm combining two different sayings because of how different they are, and yet people persist in saying both of them. That sharks are just like lions and tigers and bears, and that sharks are just like dogs and cats. They can't both be true, can they? Maybe sort of, maybe not at all. It's actually not that weird to compare sharks to dogs. I mean, they're obviously not the same thing, but I've done it. It's kind of natural to compare new things to things that you're familiar with in your life. And I'm familiar with dogs, and you start to draw some parallels. The problem is when people say, just like. For example, saying that they're just like bears and tigers. There might be some similarities in that they're predators, but here's a pretty big difference. You can't do the things that you do with sharks with lions and tigers and bears. When I went on safari and asked the guy about getting out of the Jeep next to lions, he says, yeah, if you wanna die. And yet, people with absolutely no experience with sharks, millions of people annually get introduced to the world of shark diving. My first shark dive came shortly after getting scuba certified and I was surrounded by 40 sharks underwater with a bunch of other people who knew nothing about sharks also. How is that possible? Again, bears aren't necessarily all violent and lions aren't all violent, but you just can't do that type of ecotourism with those animals. In fact, considering just how easily sharks can kill us and how far out of our natural element that we are when we go into the water with sharks, it's mind boggling what sharks allow and what is tolerated and the record of survival that we have doing that. Now let's go back the other direction, comparing them to a domestic household pet. Obviously sharks are not domesticated pets and people seem to think I'm trying to imply that when I encourage them just to think a little bit more broadly than what the media tells you to think. I will admit similarities to sharks in that 
There are many, many breeds of dogs and there are many, many species of sharks. You associate certain attributes and certain characteristics, even certain uh, personalities with certain breeds of dogs. And more or less, it holds true. But individual personalities are prevalent with dogs. They all have them if we spend time to take a look and realize that the personalities are there. Now with sharks, again, certain species are known for certain things and wide sweeping, sure, it holds true, but not 100%. Sharks also behave differently as individuals. Just because all oceanic white tips are known for certain things doesn't mean that the oceanic white tip on your left is going to behave the way that the oceanic white tip on your right is going to. I'm going to draw another comparison to the bigger shark, the more calm the shark. For example, Great Danes. Great Danes are some of the most chill animals I know, but they could disembowel you anytime they felt like it. A great white shark, like a big great white shark, some of the slowest, calmest, most chill sharks that you'll see. They don't seem like they can really be bothered with any drama. But does that mean it could have chopped me in half effortlessly? No. So, are sharks like dogs and cats? Are they like lions and tigers and bears? I don't know. All right, so what did you think of that list? That's just part one. Obviously, there's a pretty unlimited supply of dumb things people say when it comes to sharks, but that was my first offering. Let me know what you agree and don't agree with, and please subscribe and keep the comments coming. And I'm gonna do the t-shirt contest again for this one. The best comment on the YouTube channel on this video wins a t-shirt of your choice, either the Shark Minutes design, or the They Go, We Go, or the Sharks Don't Kill People, I Kill People. I'm Skylar Thomas. Thanks for watching Shark Minutes on the White Shark Video Channel. Bonus time! Okay, during the section of the film where I talked about the risk of being a surfer compared to other risks, while I was looking that up, I found a graph that showed scuba divers and surfers being close to the same risk level. And I just thought, no, that can't possibly be true. And I kept reading, and it turned out that they were lumping recreational scuba diving, like people that are just going out there to enjoy nature or sightseeing, with people that are going out there harvesting, extracting, killing things, um, and, you know, taking stuff out of the ocean. That's not the same at all. One, you're down there just looking around. The second one, you have dead animals, not just animals, marine animals that sharks actually are interested in, attached to you or dragging closely behind you. It's not a mundane detail, and it's not one that should be taken lightly. In fact, it turned out that for that graph, for that data, for the 20th century up to that point, every one of the scuba diving victims or free diving victims, anyone under that category who had been a victim of a shark bite was extracting things from the ocean. But if you were to just look at that graph at a glance, you would think, oh my God, scuba diving is really dangerous. Sharks attack scuba divers. And thinking of California, the temperature of waters that we have here and the type of animals that are extracted from here. Free divers were the worst, and I'm gonna guess that that's because of the repeated times up and down to the surface in waters where white sharks target things that go to the surface. Abalone divers were the top of the list, and this is true in Australia as well. Now guess which sharks inhabit waters where you take abalone from? Just so happens to be sharks that are big enough to be interested in targeting something as big as a human being. White sharks. Stop going into white shark waters and taking animals and dragging them behind you if you don't want to encounter a white shark. Now, if you understand what you're doing, you understand the risks involved, if you understand that you're going into white shark territory and you say, well, I'm still going to do it because that's what I want to do, that's a whole different story. But people are like, oh my God, what went wrong? That's just ridiculous. If, for example, I said to you, if you go to the beach enough times, you're gonna eventually see a naked man, and then one day it happens, do I get to say, told you so?
hey, the statistical probability of people suffering a bacterial infection, if they go in here enough times, is high. We know next to nothing about these mysterious animals. Let me take a shit on that for a minute. We don't know every last tiny ridiculous detail that there is to know about these animals, but that is a far cry from saying that we know next to hardly anything about these animals. It is exploitation being played off as conservation and education. And if you happen to log in to an app and check a shark's migration route once a year while you're taking a shit, that is not going to help that species survive. I don't care how much you want to talk about the word awareness. These claims that we know nothing about these animals are very convenient during an era in which people don't bother to learn shit about shit while claiming that we live in the age of knowledge.